Dan Prof coming to you with another edition of Against the Current from the Skyline Club atop the Old Republic Building in downtown Chicago. My guest on this edition is the Chicago Tribune's renowned political cartoonist. He is Scott Stantis. Scott, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Renowned? Well, renowned. Renowned, not renowned. It's past tense. Okay. You're current. <laughs> you're still your your current political cartoonist. Why? What have you heard? <laughs> right, exactly. So uh, you came to us straight out of Birmingham. You've yes. been in Chicago for six years after spending uh, more than a decade in Birmingham. Couldn't cut it in Birmingham. That's why you came to Couldn't Chicago. Couldn't make it. Just too. Yeah, it's just too big city. So uh, what brought you to Chicago? And uh, give us your perspective as someone who's only been here half a dozen years. Uh, not exactly half a dozen of our salad years. Uh, what your what your perspective is on Chicago coming from Birmingham? It's been amazing. People, I ask where did I come from, and I say, well, I can't work as, a, as you said over a dozen years in Birmingham, Alabama, and they look at me like, oh. I go, no, no, no. You don't understand. Alabama actually kicks Illinois' ass in so many different areas: job creation, uh, transparency. You can walk into a state legislator's office in Montgomery and say, "I want your uh, uh, your records from the cell phone that the state issued you," and the secretary will literally go and hand you the records. There's no for I mean, this state in some police. Uh, wards, you still have to a a get a FOIA to get a police report, which is public record. I mean, that thing was shocking when I came here. Not to mention the mayor's cell phone records. Which we still have Text messages, yes. Yeah, so or the videos from his property or anywhere a crime occurs or anything. So what did bring you to Chicago it's then? You're trying try to clean up this town like you did Birmingham? Or? <laughs> yes, well, everything's <laughs> yeah. just perfect there. Um, Chicago's the big leagues. It really is. Um, still, the Chicago Tribune job that historically has always been the job that editorial cartoonists have wanted. Uh, it started with John T. McCutcheon at the turn of the 20th century, won the first Pulitzer for the uh, Chicago Tribune. Uh, three more Pulitzer Prize winners came through here, not to mention Jeff McNally, who was the one I replaced and nine years after his death, uh, Dick Loker, um, and uh, many, many others. So, And, and, and where's your Pulitzer? <sighs> it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Right. I mean, you know, I know Mary Schmeek has that coveted title over. She does. Yeah. She well, does. Look, I mean, I, I can't read enough columns about cats, just like the next guy. Um, so uh, in terms of political cartoons. Yes. Uh, it is, it, it, first of all, it's, I guess, just a little bit of background. First, it, it's a rarefied space. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like being a governor. There's only like uh, 50 of you in the country, right? Oh, there's fewer than that. There's fewer than 40 now. Um, editors have... Is this, is this a function of newspapers going away or something else? I think it's both. Um, editors have always had a hard time with cartoonists uh, for a myriad of reasons. Temperamental. Not, temperamental, hard to deal with, expensive. Uh, and that's part of it. But the other part is um, they still view the written word as sacrosanct. That is far more important than so, any silly cartoon you could possibly draw. And so they look at what they do and do not want and the thing that they that causes them the most trouble. I was at a conference of feature editors in New Orleans a few years back, and I was with uh, the guy who does Pearls Before Swine, Stephen Passes, and also uh, Burt Brethard, who does uh, Bloom County. And we said to them, isn't it great when you get a reaction, when people blow up and the, either one cartoon, either a political point, or some other thing that gets them to call the newspaper, these editors looked as if we had just insulted their entire families. The point being that our take was it's great when people get involved and have a sense of ownership in your product that you produce. Their take was the readers are a pain in the ass, and I just want to produce what I produce. <laughs> the is damn customers. Yes. Um, it's an interesting perspective because if the readers are a pain in the ass, so you treat them that way, sometimes they go away. And isn't that sort of what's happening to uh, a lot of major daily newspapers around the country? I mean, I don't think newspapers are ever going to go away, but they're not going to be, I mean, some of them may, some of them have, but they're not going to be presented in the same format they've been presented at for the last 50 years, at least the ones that survive mm -hmm. and thrive. No, if you had to guess what's working now for um, for newspapers, our breaking news on the internet, um, you know, we've had this discussion a lot about what comes next in media and cell phone, your your smartphone. That's really where anyone under thirty five. That's it. That's where it begins and ends. So where does a newspaper fit into that? Um, when they visit our page, the Chicago Tribune page, through their mobile devices, they're on it for like three minutes, maybe. 
They want the headlines. They want a, a, a paragraph or so. They don't want in-depth stuff. Uh, you counter that, I think, with probably a premium pack, a premium product on the weekends on Sunday. And that may be what we're going to see down the line. But to say that newspapers won't go away, I, I, I'm not entirely convinced of that. Well, what, on, on the cartoons, I mean, the, what's the reader response? What's the... What are the, the number of eyeballs on your cartoons every time you publish one as compared to, say, Eric Zorn's must-read column? <laughs> I don't know. what the, They don't share those numbers with us. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Well, what kind of feedback do you get? I get great feedback. And, in fact, I've had a number of cartoons that have been sh uh, shared tens of millions of times. Uh, literally. Uh, the cartoon, uh, to be unfair, the more sappy ones when... Um, Oh, gosh, what's his name? Uh, the, the great movie reviewer for... Roger Ebert. Thank you, when he passed away. And that cartoon was shared. Pro-life pro -life leader, Roger Ebert. Is that true? Very, he's very much pro-life. Yeah, good. Yeah. Well, so that's his, a good Catholic thing to be. faith informed his position. That's why I like, to, I like to kind of skewer the liberals in town, reminding them that Roger Ebert was a big pro-lifer. It's hard for them to reconcile. What do they say when they say that? Nothing. They just look at you and then... Yeah, they go away, which is I, kind of I'm used to that reaction. It's mostly, mostly what I get. I mean, because... Well, frankly, I mean, most of the people in your profession, particularly in this town, you may have noticed, they're not so zealous about facts. No? Yeah. You don't think so? Yeah, they're kind of tied to their orthodoxy, and that's all they care about, which is an interesting segue to some of what you do, because um, some of your cartoons lampoon, heaven, heaven, you know, heavens, uh, <laughs> lampoon some of the sacred cows, and I mean that as a double entendre, in the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois, the political panjan drums that they like that they get along with. Lisa Madigan, the way you've caricatured Lisa Madigan over yes. the years, for example, as daddy's little girl with a balloon and a, you know, and a lollipop, um, that's that's received some pushback, hasn't it? It's yeah. In fact, a feminist group I'd never heard of from Washington, D.C., started to take me on and write letters and and start some kind form of a campaign. Clearly was paid for by somebody, I'm sure, daddy. Um, but somebody picked for Way to it. double down. Yeah, yeah you know. Um, so they don't, they don't like, you're, you're, they you're minimizing all of Lisa yeah. Madigan's Grand, legal accomplishments. Dan, think about this for just a moment. Since Lisa Madigan has become attorney general of the great state of Illinois, there has been no corruption prosecuted in this state. Yeah. At the state level. You right. have to hand that to her. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so apparently right. just cleaned it all out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's, she's outsourced it to the, the feds, I guess. I mean, yes. it's... Well, in fact, if you remember, one of the cartoons I brought here with me was... Uh, it was one of the first cartoons I ever drew of her as that little girl with the, you know, the heart dotting her eye and her name. And, she's, and, and she literally said, do you remember this? She said, that's, that's, that's above my pay grade to investigate corruption in the state when, her, when another Madigan thing boiled up. Yeah, see, that's what's fun about uh, political cartoonists. May, may be different than some of the op-ed writers in town, with the exception of your colleague John Cass. He's one exception. Uh, the institutional memory. So to go back, for example, and recall Lisa Madigan when she first ran for attorney general after she had had her law degree for five minutes, uh, that she uh, said she was running because where were Republicans when it came to prosecuting corruption under Governor George Ryan? That was not going to happen, that prosecuting public corruption in the state of Illinois was going to be her raison d'etre as attorney general. And as you suggest, people were so afraid <laughs> of her prosecutorial proactiveness yes. that they have not committed any illegal acts in the intervening 14 years. You don't want the wrath of Lisa to come down on you, unless, of course, you're a crib maker, which she has protected us from. She's pretty, yeah, the crib makers. Yes, yeah. so the, the, the crooked crib makers. Right. Yeah, that works. So don't, don't remove the tag from the mattress in, the, in that crib or she's going to come after you? It says express. So, so, so what is, it, and so with Lisa now, it's not you when you're dealing, you're not just dealing with the, the, the wrath of Lisa, you're dealing with the wrath of the most powerful politician in this yes. state with, with whom you become intimately familiar over your six years. House Speaker Mike Madigan, has, has he responded? Because he's very protective of, as you draw her, Daddy's little girl. I think there was a connection because uh, it, this this feminist group came out of nowhere, and it's since disappeared. At least the attacks on me. Um, so uh, clearly that was one response from that machine to, to my attacks on him. Just to tell you that cartoons actually do have a profound effect on politics. My first cartoon on Mike Madigan was within the first couple of weeks when I worked here, and I draw and I had drawn him, and he actually slicked his hair back. You may not remember this. And it was, and um, after that cartoon, he was doing a, a, an ensemble 
performance of Grease, I think, in Springfield. Was that it? Yeah. Okay, well, that may explain I think he, it. I think he played Frenchie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, I don't... Wow, you know. I, I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah. I am. Well, my, so he slicked his hair back. He slicked his hair back. I drew him with this, because his hairline is further back than mine. It's preposterous. He continues to part it. Uh, well, he is 120. Well, maybe. We don't know how old he is. So we have to wait for the carbon dating. Right. And he will never die. Right. So. Um, <laughs> but I noticed that a week later, his hair was puffier, fluffier, and a different color. Maybe he hadn't seen a stylist. He saw the cartoon, I think. And so again, coming back, cartoons have a definite, tangible impact on policy in this great state. Well, I mean, <laughs> but, but political cartoons are part of Americana since the founding. Sure. Right? I mean, and yes. to kind of- Benjamin Franklin, uh, uh, Join or Die, the snake that's cut into various segments. That Ben Franklin drew, drew that. And, so, and, and it's, it's a way to kind of capture the essence of an idea, of a personality, of a policy, of a yes. policy debate, right? In a way that, uh, you know, frankly, unless you're H.L. Mencken quality, six or 700 words doesn't. Right. And for me, the great joy, especially coming to a place like Illinois, there's so many players, it's almost impossible to keep them all straight. Um, but if you can draw Madigan the way I draw him now, which is pretty much as the Crypt Keeper. Right. Which is not, doesn't, if you look at him and put his picture next to my cartoon, it doesn't really look like him anymore. But every person who reads the Chicago Tribune knows exactly who that is to the point where I don't have to label him anymore. And I also like that you stay current, too. You've got Mike Madigan on the Iron Throne from Game of Thrones, too. Yes, Game of Thrones, yes. Game of Thrones, singular, <laughs> yes. If you, notice, look at the detail of that cartoon. He's sitting on a phone book. I imagine that probably has to tick him off a little bit. Well, because the, the, because he's a Shetland person. He's one of these Chicago Democrats. There's something in the water here. I make this point over and over again, and I can't figure it out. Maybe you know, because you, you're, you're kind of very precise when it comes to sizing up these characters that you draw. Um, why do we have these like little licentious leprechauns like Madigan and Cullerton and, and Rom, he's an honorary Irishman, uh, Richie Daly, uh, they're all like, they're all, yeah. they all could fit in your breast pocket. It's bizarre and, I, and, and what's, what is important about cartooning too is obviously I have the option of showing them as being roughly this tall. You know, right, so, which, is, and that's which, is, which is exactly which what I did. Drawn to scale. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Rom now is about three and a half feet tall in the cartoons, yeah. but his eyes are make him about four and a half feet tall. Because just all I have to do now is just draw those massive bug eyes he's got, and everyone gets it. So, uh, uh, Rom, Madigan, the governor, the previous governor. Yes. Who, which politician? is the most thin-skinned. In other words, the caricature that you have offered of a particular politician, where have you ever, have you gotten direct feedback or surrogate feedback that says, you know, Mr. Madigan or Mr. or Mrs. whoever doesn't appreciate that? I did a uh, draw ROM when he was first sworn in. It was a step-by-step, -step, um, exactly what it sounds like, how to caricature ROM Emanuel. The only thing I ever heard from him was, or from anyone in his office, was he walked in the next day, showed it to his staff and says, is that okay? And they said, yeah, it kind of looks like it. Said, okay, that's all I've ever heard. He does have one of my cartoons in his office. <laughs> it was when he was, the courts ruled that he was a resident, apparently if you keep your, 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 bride's, your bridal yes, stuff here. the blue dress of yeah. sorts. <laughs> yes. Or was it gold and white? Um, and he's going, expletive, yeah. That's yeah. the one he liked. Yeah. That's the one he has. What, you know, the, the only thing with Rom, I love the caricature, but the only thing is, I, I want. Do you have you ever seen him in his ballerina outfit from back in the day yes. with the the big fro where he looks like Tim Curry from <laughs> Rocky Horror Picture yes. Show? Well, why didn't you go that direction? Oh, I have. I oh, have. Okay. And I've had him. And uh, if you look at the drawings, here's a little insight to you and your and your viewers. Every time I draw him full body, he's always in some kind of a Posture, a dancer's posture. He's always, look at his feet. There is in a plale or right. plale, some French thing. Yes. And his hand is always like, there's always a pinky up. He's always, he's very dancerly yeah. whenever I draw him. Like prancing around yes. in a bar class, something and like that. And I have that. drawn him in a tutu. Yeah. So, well, tiny, you know, I've gotten there. Tiny dancer, I like it. Um, <laughs> so, so you've got feedback from him. What about... That's it. No, that's uh, it. Nothing from Madigan, nothing from Cullerton. Nothing. Um, Governor Rauner, when he was running, uh, stopped by when I was at, uh, with uh, your radio show, actually. And um, he stopped by and uh, said he liked the cartoons, even when he was the victim, which at that point he never had been. But that was nice of him. And recently, this, this, this kind of freaked me out and scares me a little bit. I don't mind telling you. Um, uh, 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 Cook County Commissioner uh, President uh, Tony Preckwinkle. Tony Preckwinkle, she, right. She is not one of the Shetland people. She is not. 
<laughs> no, she's no. Um, and quite it's interesting. Striking. She's always been very cold every time I've, I've, a few times I've met her. But she called the other day, and I had drawn her as uh, Don, Corle Don Corleone. Mm -hmm. And she's going, you know, tell Alvarez it's politics. It's not personal. She loved that one. Apparently, that's what she likes to project. And she was effusive and friendly and very, very uh, nice on the phone. So she, she likes her. to be portrayed as a mobster, but in the sensible shoes. Yes. Well, yeah. there were no shoes. But oh. she is. And um, Fox, of all people, act, jumped in apparently in one meeting and said, you know, that cat is me. I went, no, it's, it's really, you know, in the scene when Corleone is petting the cat. Kim, Kim Fox. Kim Fox, Kim, yes. Who's running for state's attorney, Against her former arrest. chief of staff. Says, you know, that, that's me in there, too. I went, no, it's, 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 it's really not. Everybody <laughs> wants to be in a Stantis cartoon, even <laughs> if you're being lampooned sure. or parodied, right? Yeah, so I've never heard from, uh, and, you know, you keep slamming away at these guys, and you hope you hear something, but no, not yet. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, you mentioned uh, the kind of the schmaltzy cartoons. I'm being pejorative, but I mm -hmm. don't mean it that way. But the more poignant or sentimental cartoons. Uh, the cartoon I remember, because we spoke about this, that you got the most reaction to, or, or perhaps the most reaction to, but you got a lot of reaction, international and maybe international reaction, was uh, a cartoon and a story about your childhood. Yes. Um, tell us about that. Well, it was... When the NFL and all the players were coming, you know, all the stories were breaking that, um, you know, one player knocks his wife out in an elevator. Another one beat his child with a switch until he Ray was a four-year-old right. child. Right. And I just, I, and all of this other bubbling, you know, excuses that, well, this is cultural. This is how we do it. This is our culture. I go, no. And if that's your culture, then it has to be destroyed because it's wrong. And I, I'm getting mad now. <laughs> it got me mad. So, and because I came from an abusive background, my father was an alcohol, an abusive alcoholic. He joined, he got found his sobriety, and we became great friends years later. But I thought it was a story that was important. I'd never told anybody. In fact, a lot of friends. Um, in fact, there are some details in there that my wife didn't even know. Hmm. Uh, but I thought it was an important, and if I was going to tell the story, it had to be the story. It couldn't just, you couldn't tap dance around it. You couldn't make it fiction. It, to make it have the impact it had. Uh, it actually re-ran on Medium.com recently and had like five million shares. So yeah, it, 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 what's been interesting about it too is I did a presentation at LitFest about it and that was hard. And that'll be the last time I'll talk details in public about this thing because it was just too, too hard. But afterwards for the Q&A, there were no there were no cues. <laughs> they were all men, mostly men, standing up in the most moving part of the whole thing was this guy stood up, a Southside Irishman, I mean, quintessential, stereotypical. He must have been six something and massive. And he, st by the time he was done, uh, that room was in tears, as was he, telling me about the stories of overcoming this stuff. And so for me, it was, it, 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 there's a couple of things about coming through an abusive upbringing. And one is that you're told never to talk about the family outside the family. I mean, that, that's yeah, a rule. right. For obvious reasons right. in hindsight, but at right, the time, right. so it just gets ingrained in you. And, and the second thing is, you think you're alone. You think this only happened to you, or it's very rare. And it turned out that it's not. I had literally tens of thousands of emails from that thing, and it was, and that's good. And, and, and so, I mean, I, I understand the, the what was going on in the NFL is the backdrop for this. But as a general rule, do you feel like? It's better to keep your professional distance from your readers and your subjects, or uh, when appropriate, to kind of open yourself up and share a personal story that that connects you more deeply to your readers. Because you know, I think people uh, that in the public eye and and uh, op-ed writers and politicians, yeah. you know, you, they go both directions. Some people are more closed off, and some people feel like uh, sharing uh, a an experience that other people have endured as well is a way to better connect and and you know build a relationship. I think I have a relationship with the readers, and and, and for me, it's a postcard. It's a little note to the readers every day, and you know, the internet uh, has allowed for more engagement, which is phenomenal. Uh, nine times out of ten, people call, even if or, or write now or comment, and even if it's really nasty, if you respond, oftentimes a person will respond back saying, "Hey, listen, I'm sorry, that was over the, over the top." Only if you respond even more nastily than they no. respond. <laughs> yeah, no, right? no, you try yeah. to be no. Oh, you oh, try oh. to be. That's you try the to approach be nice that guy. I take. I see. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, I'm out there. These are my opinions. I mean, the, I'm lucky enough that the Chicago Tribune views my cartoons as an individual opinion. And so, you know, there are times when uh, they don't like the cartoon and it gets pulled, which um, is always frustrating. But for the most part, um, they view it as my, my 
comment to the world. And so, uh, yeah, I take it very personally. I mean, you can tell I'm not a closed off person. I don't think. No, I mean, <laughs> please, just, you know, keep your professional distance here. I am a closed off person. Yes, yes. I don't, you yes. know, I don't want to be making out by the end of this. All right, so just relax. Uh, but so, but so, so that's an interesting point, right? The, your cartoons are treated the same way as per, as an op-ed writer's op-eds, which is Zorn or, to say, or Chapman or if I don't like this piece, if it's if it's rambling, if it doesn't make sense, if it's incendiary in some way, then we, you know, we're under no obligation to run it. That's, I guess it's the same with the cartoon. So. Uh, is that just an individual case-by-case -case judgment call, or are there some kind of rules of the game that are set so you know more or less where the boundaries are? More or less. I mean, it, it's it's an on the field moves somewhat, but yeah, it's basically I know what can and cannot be talked about. It's it's odd too, and I I don't know how to combat this. I don't know sure if it should be. Maybe um, you know, maybe it shouldn't be. But um, the view of the newspaper is so um, um, correct. And, and, and almost puritanical in its view of virtual of language, particularly. So uh, I do a comic strip called Prickly City, and I can still, to this day, this is the 21st century, can't say that sucks in the comic strip. And so the the notion that for some reason, you know, Dwight Eisenhower is still president uh, is uh, is still a head scratcher. I don't want to drop the f bomb. If in only, my if only to die. Yeah, no kidding. Say, yeah. <laughs> Right, so it's interesting. So you know, radio we have George Carlin's nine words, mm -hmm. um, and you have more words than those nine. Apparently, yeah, it's strange, and it's viewed. Um, I did a caption contest as well, and this week's was is is rather uh, Rahm Emanuel on the end of a cigarette, and the ash is about to fall off. Where a lot of I'm about to you know fall on my ash and stuff. A lot of jokes like that, which could not run as finalists for to vote on. It was kind of strange. I'm about to fall on my ash. Yes, or you know, I'm making words. an ash of myself. Yes, you know, obviously, because people might actually think the word ass was involved in that somehow. Well, I mean, and uh, people would be shocked. You probably, you apparently weren't listening to President Obama's speech to the General Assembly, where he called for more civil discourse in our political dialogue, and and you are coloring outside the lines as it uh, pertains yes, to that. Yes, I'm trying to uh, coarsen the culture, and I'm sorry. And so, uh, <laughs> right, yeah, right. Uh, so, Too late. <laughs> and, and so, so, so how, how does that play out to the extent that you can give us a peek into the editorial board or to the editorial decision-making process? Um, they say this goes too far, and you say it doesn't, and you have a pillow fight. Uh, how, how does that go? Yeah, it, I, well, I do a rough, I do a, a very, which is just a very quick sketch of what you know, what I'm going to, my idea, and then I send it to uh, Bruce Dold, who's my editorial page editor, and to John McCormick, who's the deputy editorial page editor, and they come back with suggestions. And uh, or not, um, it's better w when it's not. Oh, sure, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, right. But uh, you know, and sometimes there's, you know, there have uh, comments and say change this, change that, and sometimes I'll say why, and there have a, a reason that I think is either good or bad, and if it's bad, then I'll say I think that's a bad idea, and then they'll tell me do it our way. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's pretty simple. So it's not quite like uh, the agony and the ecstasy where. Uh, uh, Michelangelo is asked, when is the Sistine Chapel going to be done? And he says, when I'm finished. Yes. It's not quite that way. You don't have no. quite that quite Although latitude. Although there is a papal element to it. He does whack <laughs> me with a stick once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you're f so let's just go city and state level. I mean, who is your favorite character, to the extent that all of these politicos oh, are goodness. characters, to, to draw, and I mean, who provides the most fodder for your fertile mind? Well, Rom, clearly, because he's the guy in charge, and he came in with, it's such a, the arc of that story is so interesting. He came in because he was the SOB. He's the, you know, he, he was charmless. New sheriff. And yeah, he was charmless. He was, you know, tough just, guy. just a nasty piece of work, but he could get things done. And then after the first time, we realized he really can't. <laughs> and yet he got reelected, sadly. Um, I mean, you and I had that discussion. I have to give you your props. You s suggested that Chewy would be a better, regardless, would be a better choice, and you were right. So, on video in front of here. Finally, I get my due. Yes. Now, what, now I want a cartoon that memorializes that for all eternity. And okay. It's yes. shared on Medium and all the other outlets so that <laughs> I'm shared millions of times like your, your work product. Um, so uh, what, as it pertains to Ram, though, one of the topics that I see you cartoon most on is violence in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, how is that received, not just by the 
political ruling elites in the city, but also by your readers, the residents who actually live in some of these shooting galleries on the west side or the south side, yeah. or people who you know, live where we live and are, frankly, at, at least to this point, insulated from a lot of that. The f most surprising response I've had to a cartoon since I've worked here was uh, Tayshawn, um, last name, help me, um, the kid who was executed. Uh, the nine-year-old boy. Oh, yeah. And uh, I said, you know, he was, and it goes, Monday he was executed. Um, and drawing of this beautiful kid. And then just the next scene is just an empty Chicago street and said, still waiting for the outrage. And the idea being that, you know, Black Lives Matter, obviously massive protests all over the country on that on that subject, which I thought was private, was legitimate as well. But this is legitimate too. And you heard nothing. And I got calls after calls after calls and just on in the Twitter verse or whatever the hell it's called, yeah. um, got castigated for the cartoon because I just don't get it. And how, and how dare someone like me, and I guess that means white and male, uh, would say that there's no outrage. Of course there's outrage. And I'm going, well, you have protests and they're led by preachers, they're led by mothers. Yeah. But you don't see the kids who are actually, you know, the, the 18 to 25 year olds who are directly responsible for this. What? Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I concede your point. Do you have protests or do you, is the arc of those stories, oh, it's terrible. We're outraged for a day. We do a midnight vigil. We put the uh, child victim's image on T-shirts. We call for an end to street violence. There's a couple walks around the neighborhood. And four days later, we're on to the next uh, child victim. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you would hope for a bigger response than that from, from that community. And you don't. And that was my point. And, of course, I got raked over the coals for that from by my liberal friends as well who you know I just don't understand. Well what what is it that you don't understand from as from their perspective? Uh, that they are outraged. Ah. They, they just don't voice it. They're outraged <laughs> in silence and they continue to perpetuate yes. the status quo that produces yeah. these outrages. Yes. I see. Uh, uh, perfect. Makes perfect sense. Sure. Uh, and uh, what about a police? So s kind of sticking on this topic of violence and uh, caricaturing uh, former police chief Gary McCarthy, uh, the, you know, these, these incidents that maybe it's tough, it's tough to draw a ha-ha cartoon about, yes. like Laquan McDonald or uh, Quintonio LeGreer and Betty Jones on Christmas Day. Uh, how do you treat subjects where, you know, a punchline, not appropriate? I, one thing I come back to, my cartoons are, are, are a postcard to the readers. And it, to me, I'm not, A, I'm not angry every day. Sometimes something just mean, needs levity. But there are also yeah. times when there's sadness and anger. And the, I, I have a drawing style that allows me that, that latitude because it's, it's not very broad. It's not very cartoony. And so when there is a serious issue at play here, I mean, there's a cartoon of you know, I drew fine, when all of this violence just keeps piling up and piling up and we're losing kid after kid after, I mean, kids, you know, I mean, children. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm not, and so it's just a teddy bear with a, a, a t-shirt on that says, I gunshot Chicago. And it's very stark and it's very telling and it's very dark. And for me, that was one way to to express myself. I'm lucky I have that. But I, I, I really did develop a drawing style, an artistic style that so, allows me to do that. So are you trying to channel the emotion that you feel about the subject sure. or the emotion that you think the city feels or the, the larger Well, both. I would suspect feels. that we're all, uh, you know, f flummoxed by, uh, by the violence on the South Side. We're all incredibly frustrated by this debt. We're incredibly aghast at a, a school system that, you know, puts what, $730 million bonds out there at eight and a half percent interest? I mean, you know, yeah, there's rage, there's anger, there's remorse, there's sadness, all of that. Do you, do you ever feel like that you need to produce cartoons different than, you know, the tone that is, uh, the majority tone, the majority response to something so that you have, there's a little <laughs> bit of leavening, uh, and it doesn't, leavening not necessarily in terms of parody or comedy, but just leavening in terms of, how about looking at it from this perspective rather than just the yes. kind of conventional wisdom perspective? Right, I was uh, speaking uh, to a group mostly, it was at the Library of Congress, and mostly obviously very liberal. My take on the police shootings was that the police were shooting themselves in many ways. Hmm. And, um, of course, the panel didn't think that was the right way to go. You have to blame them. And, but 
there's two victims here. Uh, law enforcement is incredibly difficult. And so, but you bring up a great point. I'm also happen to be a conservative in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, that creates its own kind of <laughs> dynamic where, yes, I'm going to approach issues differently than, than I think most, most commentators in the city would. Do you, do you get, I mean, it's interesting because we've talked with other guests about this, talk about this on the show all the time, kind of the virulent strain of Stockholm Syndrome that afflicts Chicago. In part, you're describing it where you talk about the kind of the lack of outrage. You don't have yeah. the city up for grabs, not that I'm suggesting it should be, but you don't have the kind of response in Chicago to Laquan McDonald that, for example, you saw in Baltimore with Freddie Gray. You just don't. Precisely. You have some protests and then they subside. You have a recall uh, move on ROM and then it subsides and people get on with their business and people want to talk about, you know, people disrupting shopping on Michigan Avenue and kind of ancillary issues. Uh, I, I wonder if uh, you see those responses and you say, well, well people, people aren't getting it. And uh, the conventional wisdom is insufficient to describe what's happening. And so I, I need to come at this from another angle yeah. such that, and you do so, and you actually have people that disagree with your worldview philosophically that come and say, oh, well, even including in your newsroom or your editorial board, say, oh, I, I, never, I never thought about that way. Do you sure. see any, any possibility? Because this is one of the kind of <laughs> the fatalistic aspects of Chicago is, oh, everybody believes certain things and it's never going to change and it's liberal and all this. Do you see movement on different issues among people that don't otherwise agree with you but agree with a take you had on an issue that they hadn't considered before? I think we're seeing in the city and in the state, we're seeing the problems finally finally reaching critical mass. We have a daily who spent us into oblivion. You know, uh, I think we're, they're finally recognizing that. And the solutions that are being offered by the same old guys are the same old things. We're going to borrow more. You know, you have a mayor who's borrowing, what, another $2 billion just to pay his bills? Um, I think people finally are seeing that, and they're seeing their taxes go up and up. We have the largest uh, property tax increase in the city's history, not to mention sales tax that are through the roof. Um, this is becoming a very, at what point do people stop coming here? Um, we have, and the violence is another example. The young woman who was, uh, uh, they still don't know how it happened. Uh, we were, my wife and I took our son and his wife down to a Pilsen the other day, and we saw the want, the posters saying, any information, $1,000, for this woman who was shot in her car while right. she was talking to her dad on her cell phone. Right. Stray bullet, right? Yeah. Well, that's what we think. Oh, right, right. We don't know. Right. <clears throat> so we're seeing this more and that kind of thing happening more and more. At what point do people stop coming to Chicago? At what point do people stop coming to Illinois? We're, you know, we're hemorrhaging jobs. I don't care what anybody else says. Um, we're, we're, I asked a, 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 a well, unnamed liberal radio personality here in Chicago when I was on his show, would you start a business in Chicago? And there's a long pause. And to his credit, he said no. I said, well, um, that kind of thing. You, you have to imagine eventually it either it catches up or we become, you know, Benton Harbor. How, how are you treated in Chicago? Uh, as compared to how you're treated in Birmingham or other stops along the route? Oh, well, I think uh, people get what I do. There's a lot of people, especially in the newsroom, who've never talked to me, who hate me, <laughs> because they see the work. And that sounds go, oh, great. He's just a knuckle-dragging yeah. so-and-so. Uh, talk to me and ask me, you know, confront me. And, uh, you know, a couple of them, I've made that invitation. A couple of them have, and that's great. You know, I, I, that, I, you know, I, I, I like to have that discussion. But um, for the most part, it's been terrific. It really has been. And let's face it. I mean, once you get to city or state issues, less so here, but still that liberal conservative thing kind of melts away a little bit. And there's just right and wrong and what works and what doesn't. And we're doing the doesn't a lot. <laughs> and yeah, I, but do you get the sense, from, particularly from your editorial board, that, um, that what doesn't work uh, or based on the evidence, is something they recognize is not working because they, it doesn't work and the Chicago Tribune endorses President Obama for re-election. It doesn't work and the Chicago Tribune endorses Rahm for re-election. Well, not just that, but if you remember, we gave him a report card his first year. We gave him an A-. minus. Yeah. That wasn't my idea. Well, a little room to grow. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, you know, I've proposed this, and it's not just the Chicago Tribune. It's every editorial page I've worked on. 
um, virtually, particularly when you become ensconced in a community. But I said, in this next election cycle, let's just say up front, we are not going to endorse a single incumbent, period. You know, and okay, you make that face. That's the face they make. But the fact well, is, well, because there are some. I mean, there are some people. I mean, that are first and second termers that are actually fighting the fight that are trying to change the paradigm. So, why would you throw the baby out with the bathwater? Because I don't. I'm not sure that it is. I, I think that yes, you're going to throw a handful of, of decent public servants, but you're also going to have gobs of public servants who are god awful. Um, so okay, I have I have this discussion off every, yeah, every two right. or four years. Right, and we have and we have some primaries again. You know, I mean, I'm just thinking for the March 15th primary upcoming. You have some primaries where the primary challenger would, it represents a continuation of the same, where the incumbent represents something at least somewhat different. So I mean, is that you know when I mean it's a culture problem fundamentally in my view, but. It's also a personnel problem as an extension of that. So why would you want to dump the people that are that are working uh, as because I would argue punishment that they're for probably a, not because I would argue that the the results argue that, argue differently. Well, hmm. it's an extreme view, and, and no one has taken you know thirty five year career. No one's taking me up on it. So <laughs> now, uh, so let's let's level up to the national level, um, because um, mm -hmm. obviously your purview is national, international. Even mm -hmm. you've drawn cartoons uh, related to the war on terror and combating ISIS. I'm very popular the, in Shai Shimbum. <laughs> yes, uh, that's one of my clients. And uh, <laughs> presidential campaign sure. as well. Um, the the cartoons, the national perspective that you try and provide to uh, for the Chicago Tribune is it something where you're just trying to provide a unique t unique take on what's happening in the national scene, or are you trying to translate it down to relevance to? The, your Chicago readers. Well, of course. I mean, you want to show both. why is this? I mean, why would I care that North Korea launches a missile? Well, because it can hit the West Coast of the United States. You might have relatives there. You know, I mean, there has to be some kind of right. um, relevancy to your life that that hopefully I can bring. But also, you know, I'm also a different voice on that paper. I'm pro pro life. The paper is pro choice. Things like that. And again, to their credit, they let me run those cartoons. Um, and I am not a great fan of this administration. I did not think we should have endorsed it for re-election. And I lost. <laughs> yes, I, I lost that discussion. I think, I think that's, that's it's been established by the record. Uh, the, your favorite presidential campaign uh, candidate, excuse me, to draw in the current field. Well, <laughs> I've drawn Hillary for twenty plus years, so she's easy. That's sure. like I can do that in my sleep. And, um, and how do you caricature her? Dower. She has very heavy eyes, um, and she's very jolly. And she's had some work done, but. From here down, it's just like McCain-ish. There's a, many, many things going on. How do you draw uh, kind of mannerisms like her cackle? Oh, with that, there, here's some inside baseball. Yeah. Um, I have been berated by, we have some older women on our editorial board mm -hmm. who don't like the way I draw that she is. She has a very, <laughs> this is maybe the strangest conversation you've had on, on this program. Uh, she laughs like this. <laughs> yes. ha, 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 ha. And her eyes, I mean, she just looks demonic. Yeah. Um, so you draw That's that. Right. It's not yeah. hard. Yeah. Um, you know, on the Republican side, uh, and, and plus, and Barry, I mean, I'm Barry. Why do I keep saying Barry Sanders? Great running back. Uh, Bernie Sanders uh, is just, he looks like, you know, Albert Einstein's love child. It's just this hair is just plaf, right. and he's so, that's easy to draw. Republican side, clearly it's Trump. You know, that, that hair, yeah. which to it this draws day, itself. I cannot understand the, the architecture of it. It's a physical just, impossibility. Yeah. yeah. It just should not happen in nature, and yet there it is. <laughs> right. Uh, it's also a color. I mean, his, his um, victory speech in New Hampshire, could he get more orange? Because that was weird. Look, he, look yeah, at he it. could get more orange. He got more orange in the South Carolina debate because of that red backdrop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he actually did get more orange. It's surprising but true. Um, Cruz looks like Joe McCarthy. He has very, f similar facial features. Or Tom Ricketts. Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, Rubio is now, have you noticed he's starting to do the 
the strategic hair combing now. Yeah, because you say it's going away. Oh, it's going away. So he's doing the forward yeah. and over. Um. <laughs> yeah. See, this is we have editorial board meetings, and these very important people come in, and then when they leave, they go, "Well, what did you think of his uh, view of uh, you know monetary policy in China?" And I go, "Did you see his shoes?" <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But that's the that's the detail that makes it fun. It's right. It's oh mean, yeah. I mean, it, I guess the, it, is the point. It, this is kind of my take. I I, I never think. We should treat politicians with reverence. Uh, e even the politicians I like, I think they should all be lampooned. I think mm -hmm. they should all be made fun of so that we remember that they're not our betters. They're just some guy who happens to be a congressman or a senator or even the president of the United States for right now. And he works for us. He's Right. And yeah. so, so to keep a sense of proportionality that we're not looking at them as our exalted rulers, right? right? But as, as you suggest, uh, people who work for us. I mean, is that your take or do you... Do you pick a favorite like in the Republican primary or the Democrat primary and say, I'm going to go after the ones I don't like more and try and protect the ones I like a little bit more? That's a great question. I actually tend to, it's, it's odd going through my body of work, um, that I tend to go after Republicans harder. And the reason for that is I expect them to be better. Right. I expect them to be the grown-ups in the room. I expect them to be honest. I expect them to do the right thing. And when they don't, I really get mad, and I tend to just go, go crazy. If there are any Republicans in Illinois, you could potentially draw those and be hard on them. Are there any? Because well, uh, well, I mean, yeah, sort, of, sort of the governor. Te well, technically, uh, technically, we have a governor, <laughs> and then, um, well, then there's the governor, and and then there's the governor. Well, the lieutenant governor. Yeah, I guess we have one, right? Kind of a, it's like a, it's like a tail. It's a vestigial organ. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not so sure. I'm not sure that's going to captivate your readers. You and know, that's really what... sticking it to Evelyn Sanguinetti. Finally, <laughs> yes. Well, well, and you and I this was one of the first conversations we ever had was me trying to understand the Republicans in the state of Illinois mm -hmm. and how there aren't any. How even though they're in a super minority now in the House um, and Senate. Is it a super minority in the Senate? Oh, yeah. So why aren't they more? What do they have to lose? Can you be, I guess you could be more minority. But it just seems this whole cadre of, of that political class hoping for, they're like the hyenas, the runt hyenas. Boy, that's that's, that's fun. Yeah, I, think, fun I feel a cartoon coming out. Yeah. <laughs> who are in the back of the pack who are just hoping against hope that some piece of bone or something gets flung back there. And that's they're, they're so grateful. Um, you know, if I hear one more thing of we have to work together, why? The Democrats in this state don't want to. They don't want to do the right thing. They don't want to do what obviously has to be done. And that's what's incredibly frustrating as someone like me coming to this state, uh, especially coming from Alabama, which was predominantly a Democratic state when I got there. Shortly after I left, it's now a Republican state. Right. And um, it's a good thing to see. And um, I, 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 I can't, you mentioned it earlier in this discussion. I can't get my hands around the politics of this place. Why do these people keep getting reelected? Why is Madigan's going to, his district where I'm told he's very well liked. Yes. Even though they can look around them and see the squalor and the, and the destruction. I mean, the burning buildings. I mean. Well, here, here's, a, here's a cartoon idea for you. I'll take it. I'll, I'll invoice you later. Uh, <laughs> Banana Republic, it's a kleptocracy. And so it's cut me in or cut it out and Madigan cuts in his constituents so they're the haves, they're the mores versus the less thans. And the mores reelect the guy that's giving them more to the exclusion of, of, of others for certain, but that's the whole play. And what is rent seeking behavior and gender? Not outrage, more rent seeking. Oh, I see how it works. You have to, yeah, you have, to have clout, but is you that have to know the right people, and you have to get in line so you can get your cut. Is that number so big in this state that allows that class to stay in a position of power for this long? Well, think about the city of Chicago. Who are the, the top employers in the city of Chicago? Well, it's got to be the uh, city, the s county, uh, cops and firefighters, right? The city, s schools, well, schools. institutions, right. the city of Chicago, CPS, Cook mm -hmm. County, the state of Illinois. Those are four of your top six employers. Wow. So you tell me, is there enough uh, spoils of war to pass out, at least to pass out until the lights go out. And that's essentially been the model, the spoils of war model that both parties have abided since I've been involved in Illinois politics, since I graduated from college 20 years ago. That's been the model. And both parties have essentially adopted the model. And so you adopt the spoils of war model and 
to your point about the, the little hyena cubs in the back just hoping for scraps, that's the, the posture that the Republicans have taken because they've adopted the underlying philosophy that it's about distributing the spoils of war. And someday, if we ever get the majority again, or we have uh, a, a more, where, where we narrow the super minority into minority, or even a closer <laughs> minority, then we'll get a, a few more scraps. Well, and that's a sad commentary on the future of the state. I mean, it really is. And so, you know, guys like you, guys like the Illinois Policy Institute, others who are fighting the good fight and trying to do the right thing, uh, I, I get the sense that we're poised to, to actually move in that direction, uh, that, the, that that argument is finally getting traction with people. Based on? Hope. Right. <laughs> but, but, thinking, right. What I'm hearing, Unbounded what I'm hope. seeing, yes. I mean, and just, you know, well, you know, I, and, uh, you know, Lou from the uh, hockey game the other night, <laughs> I was <laughs> test marketing him, we were sitting next to this oh, guy. Oh, yes, and, right. And I was, uh, I, I, you're hearing it more and more. And so yes. people are recognizing that Madigan is not good for this. Yeah, no, it's a problem. And what was Lou's solution? Bernie Sanders. Well, there's that. You know, yes. I, <laughs> yes. I didn't say it was a perfect conversation. <laughs> but this is the status quo is terrible. You know what the problem is? It's not big enough. It's not status <laughs> enough. <laughs> oh, Lou. Lou. Um, let me ask you another question about another institution that doesn't get enough coverage, in my estimation. And this may be a little bit too close to home because it is your home. Um, is the question you say kind of what will take it? What, why are things the way they are? There's another institution, the Fourth Estate. Yes. Well, who watches the Watchmen? Well, who, that's who true. watches yeah. the Who watches the media? Who lampoons the media? Who takes journalists to task when they're complicit? When they have their own sacred cows that they protect to the exclusion of their job. I agree. I mean, where is the, I mean, I could name names and I'm happy to do so, but, uh, but what about that? What about those internal conversations about some of the quote unquote news coverage, forget the op-ed page for a second, the news coverage that's provided by the Chicago Tribune, the Chicago Sun-Times, the network affiliates, uh, the, the Chicago media, how complicit is the Chicago media in this complex that we have here? Uh, like how complicit is the Washington press corps in the complex right. that we have in DC? Well, look at how the Washington press corps covers this White House. It's preposterous. It doesn't. And it's fawning. Well, it is fawning. And if you've ever spent any time with them, it is. It's, it's a strange alchemy. It's, it's, it's hard, again, hard to imagine. I think what you have to do is move people in and out and unfortunately, newspapers in, in, in television don't have that, that personnel to do that with. Well, but, but, it, but it's, so we're talking accountability mechanisms. So other than you know, forcing people out, which uh, is difficult, I mean, you, you want to talk about uh, term limits or you want to talk about uh, longevity, mm, take a look around at the political reporters in this town. Yeah, exactly. Not exactly a bunch of cubs running around, uh, maybe at you know, Fox Chicago. Uh, but, 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 but by and large, that's not the case. So what about those individuals and institutions as a target for your wicked pen? It's tough. And you mentioned, and you, and you did mention it. I think that's a good, it's a great question. And there are times when I do talk about the media, but it's, it's, a, it's hard for me to do that when I, they're right down the hallway. Uh, we do keep a separation there. Uh, um, are, you, are you, I mean, is there any uh, prohibition on a, a reporter who's in the tank? Uh, maybe this is even a bit of inside industry knowledge and taking that reporter to task pictorially. I don't know that I've never done, <clears throat> excuse me, I've never done it, but I'm not sure that I couldn't. I would guess that I couldn't, to be honest. There's only one way to find out. All right. You want me to give you a list of names? After all. <laughs> <laughs> and so, no, and, it, and it's not just the Tribune, but I mean, we, we've known this for, I mean, sure. look, the idea that reporters are uh, any less transactional than politicians is folly. I, I know too many reporters for the last 20 years in this town to know better. So, so what about that? I mean, I think this, this is really kind of an under-discussed topic. I think it is, and I, but I do believe that- These are the guardians, are, these are the gatekeepers. Are, and a lot of them are very, very good. And a lot of them try very, very hard, but- So you, do a lot of politicians, so what? Right, if, but you and I have, those, have our filters, they have theirs, and that's what you're gonna get. You have, but here and in states across the country, something which I think is wonderful is happening. Things like the Illinois News Network is one example where you're gonna, people have a free option to go to some place that doesn't have 
that bias or that perceived bias even, if that's uh, what you want to do. And places like Alabama, uh, California, there are news sites now that are cropping up all over this country that are calling these guys on their coverage. And I, that's, that can only be healthy. What, what's the culture like in the Tribune and your sense of the culture in Chicago media more generally? Is it is it very much like academia, where you have a certain orthodoxy and it becomes, there's so much inertia behind that orthodoxy. And even though people are tenured, so to speak, in Chicago media, like they're in academia, there there is still this group think. I mean, so for example, in the Washington Press Corps, this has been tracked since 1960, anywhere between 84 to 92 percent of the Washington Press Corps votes for the Democratic candidate for right. president. So do you think, do you think coverage would be different if 84 to 92 percent of the Washington Press Corps we're voting for the Republican nominee for president. Of course. So it's the same thing in Chicago. Yes. And so do you think it would be would be different if if the majority of contributions at Harvard uh, weren't going to Hillary Clinton 91%, but were going to Ted Cruz, would Harvard be different? If the majority of people in the Washington Press Corps and editorial boards in this city and the network affiliates in this city and state were voting for Bruce Rauner instead of Pat Quinn or Republican candidates for legislative office instead of Democrat candidates, would the coverage be different? I, I don't think you could argue that it would. Right, wouldn't be so. Yes. So, but but this this, this is like the underreported story, and it's and it and these are the opinion shapers that drive this political culture that we all decry. But do we want to? Are we really serious about trying to expose it, be transparent about it, like you were talking about in Birmingham, so that your readers? and the body politic can make informed decisions and understand what's going on and also have some accountability mechanisms for these folks. What, what accountability would you have? I mean, other than you're wrong. I mean, here, here's a it's not, it's not It's not you're wrong. It's um, do you think you should be reporting on this story when your wife has a job in that office? Conflicts of interest, mm -hmm. clear and, and manifest conflicts of interest. For example, do you think you should be reporting on this story uh, when you have some other kind of business relationship or personal relationship with the subject or the subject's principal? This happens all the time. Well, in, even more so now as, as journalism gets more and more eroded, all the you see more and more reporters going to work, reporters going to work for, they don't go for to work for Republicans, generally. Correct, well that's another good example, right? Yeah. Anytime, anytime you have a Chicago, a member of the Chicago media leave to go work in politics, where do they wind up? Right. With a Democrat. But I, again, I mean, and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm gonna be a sycophant for these guys, but I'm right. gonna say that a lot of them really do do a great job, and they really work hard at doing a great job, but. What about for the ones who don't, though? Well, then I mean, if you don't make examples of people, then the, the bad people, uh, whatever percentage they represent, the people that are in the tank, they get away with it. They can operate with impunity. I, I think that, you know, that comes to the fore when, and it's becoming more and more obvious as, like I said, news organizations and news providers and just people who are just generally interested in one subject or another um, will bring that to the attention of, uh, of the public. And so, I mean, is there a mechanism that we could put in place that would take care of that? I don't think so. I don't want one. But what? I think people like you, people, uh, again, I go, I go to the Illinois News Network is one area where you can go and say, okay, this is the, here's another take on that same news story. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, Fox News, the success of, there's a reason Fox is the number one news network on cable television. Because they are covering things differently than the traditional, you know, certainly MSNBC, but CNN as well. Uh, no, I mean, a different angle is refreshing and it expands the parameters of debate. But I, you still have this who watches the watchmen. And it's not just those watchmen in Springfield or Washington, D.C. It's those watchmen with the pens and who buy in the old time <laughs> sense of it, buy ink by the barrel. That's a charming. Eh, thank you very much, <laughs> yeah, hearkening uh, back. Uh, so uh, the kind of last bit, bit of business on this, with respect to uh, the cartoons that you draw, uh, forget politicians or individual characters. What about on cultural issues? Yeah. The death penalty, uh, abortion, uh, the redefinition of marriage, policy matters, and yeah. cultural matters. How do you try and tackle those to take something that's abstract and turn it into something concrete that's meaningful to readers? That's, that's the hard part of the job, and I, I, it's the part I love. And it, those are the issues I love, because those are the ones that people actually care about. You know, politicians, they come and go. Um, 
but those issues will always be there, and how do you frame it? Uh, and what do you use to frame it? You know, the, the part of my job is to look at these things and say, okay, this isn't Nazi Germany, you know, um, not, but this also isn't like a Tea Party. This is someplace, um, a Tea Party, not the Tea Party. Right. <laughs> but right. someplace in between, so where on that scale is it, and how do I demonstrate this? So people who see that will immediately get that this is what I'm talking about, and this is my position on it. Um, you know, on, on abortion, um, I, I'm pro life across. Now, I'm against euthanasia, I'm against the death penalty. Um, but abortion, and especially the, um, the Planned Parenthood thing, I mean, one cartoon that got a huge reaction <laughs> was um, it's a butcher shop, and you have a, a, a fetus with parts, you know, rump and, you know, shoulder and all that stuff. It says, so how many pounds you want? And it's a Planned Parenthood person with a, and um, that, I bet that got a reaction. That got a reaction. Yes. It got a big one, but I thought it was an important point to make, and I love... I love the blowback from that whole story because they don't get charged with anything. And no one said they were doing anything illegal, which in my mind makes the story that much more heinous. But that they're charging the guy who did it because he showed a fake driver's license or something, right? right. Um, yeah. It, that's one of those issues that um, I tend to go off on. I also had like, um, oh, oh gosh, what was the, uh, the uh, breast cancer uh, Grogan who gave a lot of money to Planned Parenthood and and I show the little ribbon kicking a baby into a trash can. Um, that got a reaction. Yeah. <laughs> but, but now, when it, when it comes to though taking on those hot button issues, is there content uh, uh, oversight, or is it just kind of tone and language oversight from from your editorial board? Right. From it's your, it's from tone. Your uh, but for the most part, they that's the one area where he. My editor, uh, Bruce Dole, it gives, gives me a very free hand. He's, he's actually very grateful that they have that other voice on the editorial board, on the editorial page. Um, so it's time, place, manner restrictions to borrow kind of a First Amendment sure. construct, right? Sure. It's not, but you're, you're, you don't feel like you're ever censored in terms of you can't tackle this topic area. No. No, which is great. And uh, what's next for the Chicago Tribune, and kind of what's the next iteration as you, you ha you're in this uh, very small uh, collegial universe of cartoonists uh, in, a, in a maybe a shrinking universe of newspapers? H how do you see this playing out in five years, both for cartoonists and newspapers? Well, if I knew that. Or 10 years. If yeah. I knew that, then I, I don't know what. I'd be. <laughs> well, what, 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 what's, I mean, what's the dialogue internally in the Tribune about where we need to be versus where we are to continue to be viable? Well, we're going digital first. That's, that's the edict. And um, I think that's, that's wise to a point, although we still make, uh, newspapers still make 70% or more income currently from their print edition. So getting rid of the print edition is insanity. Uh, but looking to the future, um, you know, if you've, I, do you want a real practical thing yeah. I've done? Is the cartoons, if you look at my cartoons today versus, say, five years ago, they're much simpler. Because I know that people are going to be seeing them in 70, 72 DPI on their smartphones. <laughs> so something as simple and practical as that. Adapting to the technology sure. and how people consume the cartoons that you draw. Um, this, and this is one of the frustrations of dealing with newspapers. I approached my, my syndicate about, about this recently. And I do a comic strip, and it's usually multiple panels. I go, for, for, why don't we change, why don't we kind of change the software a little bit when they look at it on their phones, it can run horizontally instead of vertically. I mean, <laughs> sorry, or, yeah, yeah, vertically instead of horizontally, like, you know, the comic strips traditionally are like this. Right. And I've done it on my blog, and you can actually scroll up and read the comic like that, and it's really very intuitive, and it works really, really well. And they just look at me like, you know when you blow on a dog's face? <laughs> it, they have that same look, like... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, never mind. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, so it's, you know, trying to move this thing into the 21st century, is, is, it's hard. But, but, but you don't see comic, political cartoons or comic strips going away. I mean, it's it, like letters to the editor. You know, it's the most well-read section of the newspaper. It's the most visited section of the right. newspaper. People want a little levity. They want something that crystallizes their thought yes. or an issue or a personality in a picture or in a strip. I don't think we go away. I think that we take different forms, and, and, the, and it's the question that everyone's asking themselves. How do you monetize this going forward? You know, is it worth having a cartoonist on staff? Should you get syndicated work? Well, 70 for, almost 70% 70 of my work is Chicago, Cook County, Illinois. They can't get there anywhere else. So, you know, I, I, part of my Scott job protection program is, is, is doing that. Um, 
so where else, again, where else are they going to go for a ROM cartoon? Where else are they going to go for a mannequin cartoon? There's no place else for them to go. So that's part of my plan going forward. All right. He's Scott Stantis. We hope that his job is protected for years <laughs> to come. Chicago Tribune political cartoonist Scott Stantis, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me.